Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm Jen Taylor, your host. I am mom of 18, and you can find me on momsrunningit.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive right in. Hello, and welcome to Becoming Parents. I'm super excited today because I have Emily on, and Emily and I know each other through social media stalking. But we haven't actually met. Um, Emily, you're in Arizona. So I feel like I know I know you really well. I know a lot about you, but I don't actually know you. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I do live in Arizona, Southern Arizona. So we're super close to the border. <laughs> um, but it's beautiful. I love it, especially this time of year. It's gorgeous. Perfect time to be outside. Yeah, no kidding, because it's actually cooled down a little bit. I know. You live in the same town as my daughter, Olivia, who's 26 with her two babies, and we'll get to that later. Tell me about your journey in becoming a parent. You got pregnant early, if I remember right. Yes. Yes. So I had my first daughter. I was only 17. Um, I grew up a bit unconventional. There was, you know, some drug abuse and trauma with both of my biological parents. Um, And so that led me to feeling much more adult than I think I was. Um, So I got pregnant very early on with my daughter at 17. I ended up having her um, traditional OB route. I remember telling my grandmother that I really wanted a midwife. And my grandmother is a retired um, Vietnam flight nurse. And she is like, no, 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 Like, you can't do that. You know, you need, you need a medical professional and a midwife is not a medical professional. This is your first baby. You're so young, like no midwife. And I just remember being like, that sucks. (laughs) Like, that's not what I want to do. Um, And so that was difficult. Um, I ended up having her, yeah, traditional OB route, very standard procedures. I had little say in my birth. Um, Mm. It was discouraging a bit. Um, But then later on, I ended up having two more daughters and I went the midwife route and it was amazing. But yeah, definitely the first one, OB, not what I wanted. It was a difficult experience. It's so hard, you know, because when it doesn't, I mean, you were younger, so that added another element of feeling like as a woman who's pregnant, you need to listen to people who know better than you. Um, I think though, a lot of women, we have fear of what we don't know. We don't know what it's going to be like to have a baby and we have fear of pain. And every single person when you're pregnant first touches you and second tells you their horror story. Um, and w- we don't know what to expect and we don't know that we can even advocate for ourselves or that we have the right to say, you know, I'm going to question that and I'm going to say no to that and I'm going to do it differently. We, a lot of women don't feel like they can do that regardless of their age. So especially with having a strong grandmother, a strong female influence who knew way better than you did, you just listen, right? Yeah. And then you get through it and you're pissed exactly that's exactly what happened like my first experience with birth was through witnessing the birth of horses and we did a lot of like horse breeding and raising Mm -hmm. horses and all that and I just remember being a little kid and I'm like oh my gosh this is so cool like you get to witness the entire experience um I remember like our vet would let me help with do like the vet checks, like the glove mm-hmm. up to the elbow, feel yeah. the uterus. And I just remember being enamored. I was like, this is so cool. And so I wanted that really like hands-off experience for my first. And then my grandmother was like, no, like you're not doing that. That's not safe. And I just, I felt so discouraged. Yeah. Um, but because I was super young, I just felt like I had a role with it. And so I did. And yeah, it was, um, it was really difficult. Take us through the amount of time that went from the first one, because you were young, to the next two deliveries and how different, like dramatically different. And was your grandmother around for those? No, she wasn't. So like I said, family issues were, they still are. (laughs) They're pretty wonky. Um, I don't have any contact with um, either of my biological parents nor my grandmother, Um, so that was part of my growing up and really just kind of evaluating where I wanted to be in life, how I wanted to raise my baby and 
sometimes, you know, difficult choices have to be made. And it was, it was a choice I had to make to better myself and my family. Um, so no, she was not around. And I felt like I had full control over this birth. Um, I had my husband with me and he's super, super supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay. First, first baby was born in 2009. I was 17. Okay. And then we waited like a full eight years <laughs> because obviously we were really young. Um, same, same so, dad though. No, no, no. Different dad. Okay. okay, okay so okay. different biological dads. Um, my oldest daughter has a different biological dad than my younger two daughters. Okay. However, it. my younger two daughters, um, their biological father, my husband, has been around since he was 17 and I was 18 with brand newborn baby. Um, and so we've been together since she was a little over a year old. So he's been there with me since we were both super young and, yeah. and he stepped into a role that he didn't have to super early on, um, utmost respect and love and appreciation for that. Um, so no different dads, but he was, he's been around since pretty much the very beginning. That's awesome. Um, okay. So you yeah. waited, I'm sorry, go ahead. You waited no, a you're while. Good. Um, yes. A while we both needed growing up to do, and it's really hard, um, learning to parent when you don't have great parental role models, you don't have great adult role models in general. And so, yeah, it was, it was tricky and it's hard and it's difficult and it still is. I'm 31 now. And some days I'm like, I still don't know <laughs> what I'm doing, but we're doing it. So um, I'm, fi I'm so, almost 52. It will never go away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You'll exactly. always feel that way. Exactly. And so, okay. Um, 2018, our second daughter was born. Um, his first biological first together, but second daughter in general. Um, she was born in 2018. I knew the moment I got pregnant, I was like, I want a midwife. <laughs> I want a home birth. I want to do the whole nine yards. And we were living off grid, um, completely off grid, like salt, like solar power, hold our own water, the whole nine yards. And I was like, I want to birth at home. And he was like, okay, that makes me nervous <laughs> and uncomfortable because we lived pretty far out at the time. Um, closest hospital was about 35 minutes away and that's like driving fast and no interruptions along the way right. um and so he was like I would rather us birth at the hospital and for his you know peace of mind and his sanity and sake and I want him to feel as comfortable with it as I do um we that's the route we did um we only have certified nurse midwives here and so your certified nurse midwife wives don't even support the home birth anyways so where I live exactly um so that wasn't even an option so I did the next best thing CNM route traditional hospital birth but it was amazing I had like full control um the midwife who did my prenatal care wasn't the one who ended up delivering but that's okay because I had an amazing nurse that came up from Tucson um and helped me deliver and it was just a phenomenal experience I mean, all the way around um I remember with my first daughter and my OB had told me that it's mandatory for all of her clients to get an enema. Oh my gosh, like, that's archaic. Oh my gosh. Okay. What? I was like, that's <sighs> a thing. And my grandmother was like, oh yes, like that's a thing. And I'm just like, that seems so invasive and not even necessary and uncalled for. And it was traumatizing. And so when I got pregnant with my second daughter and I did the nurse midwife route. And I remember like first appointment, I think I was like 12 weeks. And I was first question I asked, I was like, do you require an enema? And she's like, uh, no. And I was like, oh my gosh, yay. <laughs> like, and then my whole world just exploded. Like I have actual control and say over my body in this birth experience. Um, it was amazing, completely different, completely different than my first birth. Um, my first birth, I even had like an epidural and I did like 17 hours of labor. And uh, as my labor was progressing, my epidural wore off. And so by the time I hit transition for her, I could feel everything. And that was also traumatizing. <laughs> and so these were all points that I was bringing up to my midwife. Like if this happens, you know, like, will you listen to me? And she's like, oh my gosh, yes. Like the 
the model of care is just so different and it's so patient centered rather than centered around an OB. And that, that's just my personal experience, but it was complete 180. No, I think it's a lot of women's experience. I, I for, Again, I don't think women realize how much control and say that they have and that you can just say, no, I elect to not to do that. I will sign a paper saying I'm not getting an enema. Um, we don't realize that, I think, a lot of women. And also, you know, everything's at the convenience of the OB. And when you take a step back and you have it be more about the woman who's pregnant and the baby, it may take longer, but it's going to be much more beautiful. And I I had a beautiful hospital experience. So I love, I love when women say, you know, there was a reason that I couldn't do it the way I wanted. And instead of being upset that you couldn't do it at home or the way you wanted, I within that, I had a really great experience because I felt the same way about mine. I had to be there. It was an extenuating circumstance, just like you. I mean, you know, you had an extenuating circumstance and I still, it was still an amazing experience. So I love hearing that because it's not just about home versus hospital or midwife yeah. versus, and you know. Yes, exactly. And home birth isn't meant for everybody. And some women, they'll have this beautiful hospital birth experience. And they're like, there's no way I could have been that comfortable at home. Because right. then in the back of in the back of mom's mind, she's worrying about the what ifs and, and all that. And that can really stall labor. Um, and so everyone's always like home birth versus hospital birth and home birth isn't for everybody. It's not for everyone. No. So take, take us to number three. Because there's a third yes. one here. Yes. So we had our little pandemic baby. <laughs> she was born in September of 2020. Um, and so with my second birth, my oldest daughter could be in the room. That was super important to her. I wanted her there if she wanted to be there. And so she was really involved and it was beautiful and I loved it. And that was my hope with the third baby was to have both of our daughters present. Um, and because of COVID, they weren't able to. And so that was discouraging. It was really discouraging, but regardless, my husband was there. We had this beautiful baby, um, again, certified nurse midwife, but I had complete control over my birth experience and it was amazing. It was a really good experience, completely different from my OB. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's just a beautiful hospital birth. That was, again, we still didn't have midwives where I live that supported home births. Um, so that was my option was our local hospital and it was a good option for us. It worked. Did you have any, how was your husband with it? He was way more relaxed, I'm sure, but he was also, he got to be super involved too. I mean, you really got to design the birth that you wanted. Yes. Yeah. Um, he was super involved to an extent. Um, you know, he, he's also a really reserved man and especially, especially in, you know, a hospital setting here we are again, where yeah. we feel like everybody around us has hierarchy and a hospital is the only place that you're going to ask if you can use the, your own bathroom that's in your room. You know, like you're going to ask your nurses, like, can I get up and go to the bathroom? And that doesn't happen anywhere else. And it's just because we feel like we are so low on the totem pole there. Um, you're afraid to mess up. You're afraid to do something that goes against um, standards. And so he was involved, yes, but he was also really reserved just because, you know, he didn't didn't want to upset anybody and I'm just like babe you're allowed to cut the cord or you know like you're allowed to and he's like oh it's okay and I'm just like okay like <laughs> I want you to be as comfortable as with it you know with everything as you want to be um and so it was nice it was a really good experience I love that I think also let's talk about the dads for a second because that's part of the reason both of us went in, went on to become doulas, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, it isn't that the dads aren't awesome and supportive, and it's not that a doula replaces them. They have to look at their wife in like the most pain in the worst situation, growing their human. You know, I mean, it's a pretty stressful environment and they feel the same that we do as women. Like we can't say what we want. We can't assert ourselves. We can't advocate for our wives. We can't like they feel that same sort of pressure, which is kind of mm -hmm. where a doula comes in. And I want to shift that because all of this, the, your experience with your three deliveries um, created your business, basically, uh, in a way. I don't know if I'm saying that the way you would. So did you have a doula for any of those? 
I didn't. So, and I find that that's super typical with women who help others and who serve others. We really, I don't want to say worry about ourselves less, but we're like, we can care for ourselves. Like we know what we're doing. We're confident, we're capable, but we're also there to serve the women who don't know everything and who don't know what to expect. And so that was definitely my standpoint is I was like, I don't want to do a, like, <laughs> I don't need to do a, I'm okay. I can do it on my own. And I'm super quiet during labor. I, you know, I labored for as long as I could at home with my last two births. I labored and then we got to the hospital and baby babies were both born within like an hour of being at the hospital. So I did my own thing at home separate and I didn't feel like I needed a doula, but like I said, I feel like that's really common with us. I've spoke to so many women and they're like, no, I wouldn't want a doula because you're confident and you're capable in your own abilities. Um, and so that's how I see it is I'm here to serve everyone else. Like I took care of my own three births. I'm done having babies now. Let me serve my community. Let me see what I can do to step in and help raise awareness, bring support, empowerment, education. Let me be that for you. Well, because you needed that the first time around and didn't even realize it. Yes. <clears throat> I didn't have a doula my first birth either. And, you know, I had good female support. My sister was there. Um, my mom was there. Sometimes that can create more stress, you know, when it's family members, I think it went really well. And I had a good experience. It's a doula would have been, I had a doula for the next three and it made a, um, and my sister was still there and I had a doula, you know, it, it made a significant difference, but also I got past the first birth. And although I had a good experience, just like you, you know, you're in this situation and you're not sure what you can do or say. And I had a great hospital experience my first time around. No enemas, no crazy stuff. But a doula is there to know what you don't know. You don't know to ask the questions that you ask. So talk about how you moved into that. So I actually, it was the middle of COVID. Um, I was pretty well pregnant with my third and I was just like, I just remember sitting there one day and I was just probably like zoning out, I think. <laughs> and I was just like, I had this thought and it was like a light bulb moment. And I was like, I should be a doula. And I text my husband. I was like, babe, I want to be a doula. And he's like, uh, what's that? <laughs> so I like, you know, explain it real fast and whatever. And then I started looking into trainings and then I was like, I could really see this going somewhere. And then I start looking locally, like what doulas do we have? And in 2020, all I could find was one doula. And so I called her and she was in Sierra Vista, but she had moved like two years prior to the East Coast. And so like the Google information wasn't accurate. And I was like, do you know of any doulas here? And she's like, nope, when I was there, I was the only one. And I was like, why is there no awareness around this? Like, why don't your doctors, even your midwives, your CNMs, why don't they ask you about a doula? Like, let me dive deeper. And so that's what I did. I really took the end of my third pregnancy and I just deep dove and found out all this beautiful information. And I'm just like, this needs to be discussed. This needs to be highlighted. This is things that the women in our community and the families deserve to know. They deserve to know that this is an option. And so I really just took that time and deep dove. Um, I became certified, had my baby took some time off um, immediately following the birth, uh, about six months or so. And then I really kind of jumped in feet first and did it. And it's been beautiful. Um, it's definitely been an adventure though. I love it. You're, th this is how we met. So I, I'd love to start to jump into that. So my daughter, Olivia, who is totally fine with us sharing her story. She actually, um, a couple weeks ago, talked very openly about her miscarriage story and talked about you. So I know we have permission to talk about her. So she has two little ones, um, almost three and 18 months. So in the next month or so, there'll be three and 18 months and she was pregnant. <clears throat> so I got, I'm trained as a doula. So she has her mom, right? And she was raised with me being a lactation consultant and a doula. So very familiar. When her first baby was born almost three years ago, she was like, holy cow, 
Now I know why you did this, mom. Now I know why other women do this. She did not have a great hospital experience, unfortunately. I got there the day after he was born. I flew in the day after he was born. And um, she did not want women to experience what she experienced. And so I think you become and you become kind of angry and you realize it doesn't have to be that way and you get more angry and then you want to do something. And so you become that for other people. So she's a doula. I'm a doula. I have special training in bereavement. So miscarriage, stillborn, fatal diagnosis, NICU, all of that stuff. And she called me on a Saturday morning and look, we FaceTime several times a week and I FaceTime my grandkids. So when, if you're on video, you can, you can see this, but when I get a FaceTime call from Olivia, I'm like, you know, I'm expecting my grandkids. <laughs> they, that my grand, my 18 month old granddaughter knows how to call Nani. So she'll give me a call and I'm like, hi. So I did my, and then I see Olivia and I was like, whoa, let me get headphones. Hang on a second. Hang on. Cause something was very wrong instantly and you can feel it. So I put my headphones in and she told me she had started bleeding. The problem with us, because we have so much training is we know the stats and that's a good and a bad thing. And I said, well, Olivia, you know, the stats one in five women in the first trimester bleeds one in four women miscarries. We're, we're here. We are. She had a, her first appointment with her home birth midwife that day. So she kept that appointment to say, kind of say, to meet her and say, what can I do? And she got all the things she could get and all that she went bed rest did all the things she could do. So if she was at one of the five women that bled, she would, she would have done everything and the baby would be fine. And she just move on with her pregnancy. The next morning we were on FaceTime and she lost the baby with me on FaceTime. She had part of it on her pad and lost a clot in the toilet. And I said, I'm going to ask you to do a hard thing and dig it out. She said she would have done that anyway, like just instinctually. Lots and lots and lots of the percentage of women who flush the baby because they just, including myself, 19 years ago, you, you're so overwhelmed. You don't feel like you can do anything else, but she was a trooper. I told her to put all of the remains in a jar. I knew she wore contacts. So I'm like, use your saline solution, which is what you need to use. Dump saline solution in a Mason jar, put the remains in. And she said, mom is a placenta. I mean, I can, I know what I'm looking at. I know which piece is the baby and which is the placenta. And I said, if you can take a picture and send it to me. And she did. And there's not a lot to confirm there. When you know what it, what you're looking at, you know what you're looking at. And um, I knew she had three days to keep to keep that the remains in saline solution before she had to process it. So I was calling mortuaries in your town because that like what can you do and what do you want me to do? Um, she wanted me to fly in, and I decided if she ended up with a DNC, I would fly in. But if it wasn't surgical, I was not going to. That was a tough decision. And um, calling my mortuary here, where I live in Reno, and your mortuary there, it was actually a conversation with one of the women there that said, "I mean, I knew their bone doesn't start to develop till six to seven weeks." She, there wasn't enough bone and bone is what you get in cremation. It burns off all the tissue for lack of a nicer way to say it. And you're left with the bone fragments. So basically in the first trimester, there wouldn't be anything left. And it was interesting because I did all this really intense training on bereavement. And this was not something that was covered. And I'm, I'm, I'm really sad about that because what you want the woman to contact you while she's in the process, but then I felt like, okay, I, I've never had someone this early on. What is the process? And I learned the woman at your mortuary said, what about placenta encapsulation? What about a dehydration process instead of an incineration process? And I was like, oh my gosh, that is the answer. And I called Olivia and I said, I know, you know, another doula in town who does placenta encapsulation. This is what I want you to do. I want you to send her a message, let her know what's going on and see if she feels comfortable taking all the remains and 
doing the dehydration process of placenta encapsulation and putting it in jars for you because you have a very limited window when the miscarriage is happening. But once you have the cremated remains, you can wait years to make jewelry or honor the baby or spread the ashes or bury it. But if you wait too long, your only option is burying it in a potted plant. Like you have no other option. So I was really pushing her that first couple of days. So you, my love, are the doula that she sent that text to. And this is how we connected. So you jump in and tell the story from here forward. Yes. So I remember I was driving home, I think from town, getting groceries with the girls, my kids. And um, my phone goes off and I look at it and it's from Olivia. And I, I had met her um prior to this, uh, just for being another like local doula in our town, we've chatted a few times over coffee. And so I was like, oh, like, let's see. And so like, I lift it up. And then it was something along the lines of like processing an early miscarriage six weeks. And it has to do with her and placenta. And I was like, there's so much information <laughs> in this text. Like I need to get home. And this really needs like my undivided attention. Um, so I like shot her a quick message back. And I was like, hey, uh, yes, <laughs> let me get home and I'm going to actually message you. And so I sent that. And then like 20 minutes later, once I was home and everything was settled, I really deep dove into the information that she had sent. And um, she said that, yes, she had lost the baby at six weeks. And she had read and learned and heard that you can cremate it using the same process as placenta encapsulation. <clears throat> mind was blown. I was like, right? what? <laughs> why has nobody taught me this? Like, right. what? And you and I had taken the same bereavement training. And okay, I'm like, so I'm that's thinking where, that. Right. So you I'm did, thinking, right. Did we get any of that training? Yeah, I know. No, right. I'm thinking back and I'm like, maybe like, do I need to like reopen my course real quick and see like, if I just skimmed over and missed something and I'm looking and I'm like, no, this is nowhere. This is nowhere to be found. And so I was like, yes, like I would love to do that for you. I would be absolutely honored to do that for you. I will absolutely do it. Um, I was like, but I have to disclose that I've never done it before. And she's like, it's okay. Um, and so she was telling me that she had uh, spoke to her mom and that her mom had spoke to the mortuary and then they had mentioned the process of placenta encapsulation as a way to cremate the early miscarriage. And I was like, this is absolutely amazing because yes, with any miscarriage, um, you know, up until 20 weeks, it's just regarded as medical waste and there's really nothing anybody can do about it. Um, you can't cremate it because cremation, all you're getting back is bone fragments, um, all your skin tissue, all of that's incinerated. So I was like, I would love to. And uh, that's really where it started for us. You did um, something incredible that I hadn't thought to ask about. Like we learned so much through this process. You took pictures and that's something that the mom who's miscarrying I mean, unless you're over 20 weeks and you're in the hospital, you know, I mean, there are different situations, but moms, even in that situation, if you don't have a bereavement doula to help you like, Hey, you need to get your placenta and the fetal remains and bring it to this mortuary. And this is what happens. And let's get some photos. You don't, you're not in a position to think about it. And it's so emotional to lose a baby. You're not a photographer at that point. And I hadn't even thought to have her ask you that, but you took pictures that were so beautiful. And that's how we figured we had the same training because you posted them on our bereavement doula private group on Facebook. And I was like, holy cow, Emily, wait, we have way more connections than we realize and it was also a great place to open up some of that discussion to really like dive in. And then you and I, <clears throat> I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but from that, you and I and our and our mortuaries and our studies and what is biohazard and what's perishable, like we've we it, we have a system now. And now anyone that comes to me, I send to you. So you are the only person in the nation that uses the dehydration of placenta encapsulation for, for first trimester or up to 20 week miscarriages. Yes. 
Holy yeah. cow. So you did it. So keep going with the process. You were worried about it. So you, you were doing this process. She drops it off. Yeah. So I remember like I drafted up with every client. I do a basic contract. Like I, I have contracts for literally everything. And then I was like, I have absolutely nothing for this bereavement. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? And so like I quick, quickly drafted up um, a contract using my placenta contract. And so she had like informed consent as the, the entire process. Um, it's not lovely to read about nor discuss, um, you know, the entire process of placenta encapsulation and how that pertains to an early miscarriage loss. Um, but it is something that I did want her to be like fully aware. And we were on the exact same page as to my process and what I would do and everything like that. Um, she was totally down for it. She signed the contract right away. I, you know, she handed me her miscarriage and her mason jar. Um, and I came home and immediately got to work. I remember I was really concerned with losing too much tissue because it's so fragile. Um, I did like a mist, <laughs> a mist setting to really kind of wash it away, wash away excess blood and contact solution and all that. And I just, I remember I had my, my rubber glove on and I'm holding her and I'm just like, this is so amazing. Like, I'm so happy she reached out to me because this is what women would just flush in the toilet and bury it deep inside themselves and never talk about it, discuss it, bring it out into the open. And so I remember just holding her and I was like, gosh, she's beautiful. And so that's where I took some of the pictures um, that I had posted and stuff. And I had like Olivia's consent, of course, for posting pictures. And I had asked her prior um, and all that lovely stuff. And yeah, that's really just where it started. Um, after that, I slowly moved into the dehydration process and I just based it really a lot off my placenta training. Um, you know, really low heat over an extended period of time and frequently checked on it. Um, and it was beautiful. It turned out, I think, absolutely stunning. I'm so honored that I could do that for her. And I'm so happy to know it's something that we can do. Like, like we've discussed, nobody out there has taught us this. Like, where do you learn this? And I was even Googling. I was like, <laughs> placenta encapsulation for early miscarriage and my results were like not coming through with anything and I'm just like bereavement miscarriage keepsake <laughs> like what and there's nothing and I was just like oh my gosh <laughs> why why hasn't anybody thought of this why hasn't anybody talked about it um and so yeah I'm super honored that I can do it and that I can really provide that service for others and I think it's beautiful I don't think, again, women don't, I, it's just crazy to me. We don't talk a lot about miscarriage. And when a woman miscarries, unless you're over 20 weeks and it's in the hospital and I mean, or even at home, like, and we are basically taught to just move on with life, like walk it off and move on. Like nothing happened. You had a rough period or, you know, a delivery prior to term isn't considered physically hard or emotionally hard or hormonally hard. And it's so fascinating to me because no, her hormones at six weeks weren't what they are at 40. And that baby at six weeks, she went through a delivery though. And although it might've been physically easier in that first trimester, true, hundred percent true. Um, it's no less of a baby. But was it easier? You know, like, no, maybe not. Thing. Well, physically, she didn't go through physically. hours of labor and stuff like that. But, but no. the emotional aspect that mm -hmm. goes into it, like these are like women deserve to be heard about this. Like they deserve to have somebody ask, like, how are you? Like, don't give me the fluffy BS. <laughs> how are you? Like, how are you holding up? What can I do for you? What, what do you need right now? And that's something that women don't get when it comes to miscarriage, even, even with abortion same thing you know it just it goes unsaid and there's nobody nobody there to really just ask like what can I do for you how are you holding up it's just not there and that's really where it lacks and I think that's where you and I really come into play with bereavement work yeah because if you have a baby and people bring you meals and help clean your house there's no reason we can't do it for women who are miscarrying and and, and really the only difference is that physically it was easier, faster and easier than a, a full-term delivery, but emotionally even worse because all your 
your hope and your joy and your the potential of this child is now gone. And the birthday is the same day as the death day. And part of our training, you know, you the training was intense and really good and it lacked some things. In my experience, what it lacks is um how to get people pe you cannot process a death if you haven't processed a birth it's just it's grief that has nowhere to go it's you know what i mean and so i take my clients through the birth of the child and they talk about it in the training it's called the welcoming so you welcome your child you name them you do a birth certificate you do some sort of keepsake um because a lot of the time women are processing their miscarriage years later it's not happening like olivia was a best case scenario we had her as it was happening and that's what we want with every situation regardless of the gestation or where you're giving birth usually women don't even know they can ask or that there is help so when i get a woman from years later we go through the birth of the baby i help them put together medical records if they had a dnc you know there's this whole process of let's put the puzzle back together of the birth and the naming of the baby and the establishing that this child was born and then the death, even though they were on the same day. So we are left with a lot of good training and then having to figure out the direction. This was like, I, I can't believe no one has thought of this before. I'm glad you're the only one in the US. I, um, there was a discrepancy when you and I were looking it's like, you know, the fetus up to 10 weeks and then it kind of jumped to 16. And the issue is when does enough bone form that cremation is the better option? And the good news is we all hate to see on our medical records that it, our, our miscarriage is dubbed as medical waste. Here is the silver lining to that. Medical waste just needs what? Tell me, perishable sticker. You put it on dry ice. Dry ice, perishable sticker, write that it's fragile and you can ship it. And so then at that point, that means say you miscarry and you've put baby miscarriage in contact solution, you put it in a tightly sealed jar, maybe, you know, a couple of Ziploc bags and a bubble wrap and in a box and you can ship it and I can make your cremains. Um, it's not, it's, it's perfectly legal. Um, it's right. not, it's not, it's not viewed medically as a baby. It's just, it's just medical waste. That's all it is. And it sucks to say that. Um, but it's also good news because then I can take care of that process for you and I can ship it back to you after it's been dehydrated and cremated and in a beautiful little glass jar. And you have this absolutely stunning keepsake um, for you to either do whatever you want with really. I, you know, some women want jewelry, some women don't want that. It's right. really just personal preference. But even if you're not ready to process it yet, you have that keepsake. And you can store it in a nice little dark place. And when you're ready to really dig into that, it's it's there for you. And it's it helps in the healing process. A lot. It helps a lot. And I think that's the issue with miscarriage is like, even if you're at the hospital, you can ask for all the medical race, waste remains before 20 weeks. You can say, I want you to release all the medical waste to me. And they will. Uh, after 20 weeks, you know, you're, you're talking about a going to a mortuary instead of you, you can ask for your placenta though. And you can, there's so many things that you can do that you don't realize. The first thing is that you have to know to save and ask for the remains and the good news about medical waste. Finally, there's good news about a baby being called medical waste is that you can do the cremation process up to 20 weeks. And the problem is that it's time sensitive. You have to keep or ask for your remains that moment. And you have to get them in saline solution that moment. And you want to ship within my, my understanding is three days. Do you have a different understanding? Can they wait longer in saline? I would say when you wait too long, you really risk, um, you know, losing a lot of tissue. It just being absorbed and dissolved and really just kind of 
goes to the bottom of the jar. Um, so ideally within three days, I would say maybe even like a three to five day time period, but I, right. nothing over five days. Like there's no way I think a week would be um, suitable for this process at all. Right. And that's, that I think is the issue is that women knowing women asking or keeping and women shipping it out because it's so time sensitive. This, this has changed a lot. Well, now I know, right now I know with a miscarriage, I know what to do if it's up to a certain week. Um, I knew before, like I knew to tell Olivia, keep everything, put it in saline. I could get a certain point, but then it was like, and then what, like now what are we going to do? And now we know what to do. So it was awesome because you and I connected. And it was awesome that Olivia has these. You did two jars for her, one that's sealed and one that has enough because you knew she would want jewelry later on. And you work with one company and she and I have worked with a different company. It really doesn't make much of a difference who you work with. There's lots of them. Um, yeah. How has this changed your business? So it is something. So, okay jumping back. So being a full spectrum doula, yes. I am able, I am able and I am certified. I am knowledgeable in the entire spectrum of pregnancy. And that's really how I view pregnancy is it's a spectrum. Um, so I am able to support births. I am able to support postpartum women. I am able to support bereavement through miscarriage, abortion, the whole nine yards, whatever your pregnancy experience is. I can support you and I have resources if you need more than what I can offer. And so um, really it's just something I've been able to add on is an entire bereavement keepsake package. And so I've added it onto my business along with my um, birth support and postpartum support, um, you know, birth attendant, that whole thing. I've also been able to add on bereavement. And I find that that is just so amazing. Um, because nobody else, <laughs> nobody else does. And it's really up to us to get this information out. Um, and so I, okay, so I posted on the SBD website, uh, still birthday mm -hmm. website or um, Facebook group. And I had shared the pictures and all that. And I had so many women, so many women, women, birth workers, midwives, nurses, and they're just like, what? <laughs> how did you do this? Where did you learn this? And I'm like, the girl is also a doula. Her mom's a doula. Her and her mom found this way that you can do it through a placenta encapsulation. They reached out to me because I'm the only one, you know, we live in a small town. I'm the only one that does placenta encapsulation. I was totally up for it. Um, and so it's the same process as placenta. And these women are like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Like, how did I not know about this? Um, and so along with adding the actual package to my website and to my, my services through my business, I also created a bereavement guide. And it really, it's a nine page guide and it went through my entire process, all of my supplies that I needed, um, pictures along the way, side notes, everything. It went through everything. And so then I also have that for sale up on my website. It's $20 for a guide. It's called um, Bereavement Keepsake Guide. I've had moms reach out to me about it. And I've also had other birth workers. And I feel like <clears throat> it's amazing that, you know, you, me, and Olivia have been able to really get this information out there. Um, it's definitely been a huge thing that I've added. And there's been a lot of interest in it. I did have a couple women <laughs> message me and they're like, wait, if it's the same process as placenta encapsulation, how do you mentally right. do that? I think they were like, I don't think that that's, that's right. And so I took the time <laughs> and I sat down and I'm responding to this message and I'm just like, I'm doing something for these women that nobody else could do that a hospital wouldn't do. I am honoring something that is incredibly special. I am holding space, not only for this woman and her family, but for her baby. And it can be emotionally taxing, but I do take a, you know, a, a fairly spiritual approach with like energetically cleansing my, my space before I did Olivia's process. Um, I really just wanted to, you know, set the, 
set the tone, set the energy, and just make sure that everything was to flow as it should. Um, and so I wrote this all out. And this woman is like, that's amazing. Like, I never thought of that. And I'm like, it is kind of difficult if you are familiar with the process of a placenta encapsulation. There's dehydrator, <clears throat> there's knives and cutting boards involved, there's um, coffee grinder or, you know, whatever herb grinder you choose to use. Like, there's tools involved that can make people uncomfortable. But I was like, if it weren't for me, this baby would just either have, you know, gotten flushed or ended up in a trash can at a hospital as biohazard. Um, so although it's it's really difficult and some people might find it really difficult, um, the lady that I spoke with was like, that's beautiful. And I never even thought about that. And so it really, if you take the time to understand what we're doing and understand what we're providing, um, it's beautiful and it's something that nobody else can do and that no other medical professional or medical professional in general can do. Um, they just toss it to the side and tell you to, you know, have a good rest of your day, take it easy for a few days and, and that's it. I think it's interesting because nobody questions the fact that a mortuary uses an, a, use, they use a, a bucket, like a, a steel bucket and they put remains in it and they put it in, in, 2000 degree fire or whatever it is so that you can get back the remains of that person. Nobody questions that. Nobody thinks it's gross. Nobody wonders how could you possibly do it? Nobody says a word about that. And on the flip side, I lost twins at 16 weeks and I called to find out what happened to the remains because I didn't know I could ask for them 19 years ago. And the pathologist said, well, this is going to be a tough conversation for you, but what we do is we put them in an autoclave and an autoclave is used in dental offices and doctor's offices to sterilize the metal instruments. They put them in the little bags, put them in the autoclave, it gets super hot and it kills all pathogens, all bloodborne pathogens. That's the goal so that the instrument is sterile. So they take the remains and put them in a bag and put them in an autoclave to, quote, kill all bloodborne pathogens, and then they put it in the landfill. And nobody questions that either. Like, it's totally fine for them to shove it in a bag, stick it through an autoclave, and dump it in the in the trash. It's not even in a medical waste trash. It's totally fine for the landfill. It goes to the landfill because it's been sterilized. So that, that's not a big deal, right? When women talk about losing, having a miscarriage, nobody asks, what do they do and where does it go? Or if the baby, the, you know, the pregnancy is old enough to go to a mortuary and the parents think to ask and do that because the hospital doesn't tell you, you can take your remains to the mortuary. Our mortuary here does it for free until a baby's one year old. You're not even paying for your cremains. You're paying for the container it goes in. So like, why aren't medical professionals saying, do you want your remains? Do you want options? Do you like, what do you want? Because even planting it in a potted plant in your house is a better option. So I think it's interesting that you've gotten backlash at all. It makes me obviously very passionate and a little upset because nobody questions what the hospital's doing and nobody questions what the mortuary is doing. Like they're no big deal. What yeah. you're doing is much more intimate. And the hardest part of that is you emotionally processing it, but not actually what you're doing. What you're doing is great. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And the only caution would be, I guess the same thing for a mortician. They're taking bodies and putting them in an incinerator. Like you have to be yeah. able to do that physically and emotionally. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I just went on a rant. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> and I was totally expecting, I, my husband, you know, was there with me um, towards the end of the process. He had gotten home from work and I had described him what I was doing. And he was just like, are you okay? And I was yeah. like, yeah, like I'm, I'm good. I, it's actually fulfilling. It's fulfilling knowing that I'm able to do something for this woman that would not be able to be done otherwise. Um, but I knew, and I told him, I was like, I'm going to post, you know, some pictures and, a, you know, a little thing about what this is and how I did it. And he's like, it might get flagged and taken down. And I was like, it might. 
like this might, this content might not, you know, get out on social media. I'll have to find a different way to really like let women know that this is a mm. thing and to really spread the information and awareness about it. Um, and he's like, you know, or as my sister, she's like, some people are probably going to get really upset. And you post anything on the internet. And like, I always expect backlash, no matter what it is. <laughs> my, you know, even though like my social media is it's super safe, um, safe content and stuff. I feel like you're, you know, there's always somebody out there <laughs> wanting to argue what you're doing. And so it was a lot for me to really, I really wanted to put it out there. I was also aware of the fact that it may not get to you know the people who need to see it or whatnot but I was like whatever I'm gonna do it anyways any ways I posted it and it like went viral um it was being like shared in other countries I had I think it was a midwife in Ireland reached out to me about it um I've spoke with so many women who you know had lost babies from abortion miscarriages the whole nine yards and they're like I had no idea this was a thing like where were you two months ago and I just wanted to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, like, I wish, I wish others did this. I wish others knew about it. I wish it could get out there. Um, and that's really where, you know, you and I, I feel like we have to spread that information. We have to spread that awareness. And the, the hard thing is with the bereavement keepsake is unless it's a planned termination, there's no way to really know what to do. And you're in the heat of the moment and you don't know who to contact, who to call the process, the saline, mason jar, people don't know this. Um, and so a lot of it is just us trying to get the information out there and educating women and families. So they know that this is an option and they can, you know, tell it to a friend who's, you know, had miscarriages before and she's pregnant again. And she's like, well, Hey, like I heard of this thing, you know, just it's there you know, take it as you will. Um, that's really what I want to do with this is just get it out there. And the more people and the more birth workers like us who are interested in learning the process and learning how to do it, um, the better, the better it is. Emily, thank you so much for being on. You shared such a great story of your own. And this was took on a life of its own because of how we've known each other. But I'm glad that like, I kind of meet you now. <laughs> yes, not yes, in person but kind of and um it's been quite an adventure but I love how your story has played beautifully into all of this and that you were the absolute like how how amazing that you're the one that Olivia contacted and how much has happened since then so thank you thank you thank you I appreciate it